Amen. All right. Now, there's going to be a lot of notes probably on this one. So you all want to get your notes ready. Okay. You're not going to really find this much in Albin Douglas's book or Dr. Upman's theological study. It's mostly uh, my notes that's combined with theirs. Today, we're going to be talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit. If you came to our summer camp or you heard about what we did at our summer camp, this doctrine was practiced a lot. People trying to implement their gifts, people trying to get involved. Perhaps you took something out of the sermon where you want to use your gifts rightly for the Lord. So this lesson will tell you everything about the gifts of the Spirit, what you should desire, how you should use it rightly, and you can even use it wrongly. So that's got to be corrected. Or some things that you're not confident about that you need to have faith in the Lord and to work out those gifts. So let's talk about the first section, kinds of gifts. Kinds of gifts. If you look at our chart over here, the two main passages you're going to hear commonly by people about the gifts of the Spirit are Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. These are the verses if you want to find your gift, when different churches talk about gifts. Now, this is supposed to be basic doctrine, remember? So if you don't know this, then you ought to know it now, okay? So this is such a basic that even non-denom churches know about this. So Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. These are the kinds of gifts given. You can write those things down right now. You can write those things down right now, and we're going to go through the list here. There's about 20 of them. There's 20 of them. So 1 Corinthians 12 is the first place that we're going to turn to, and we're going to read verses 8 through 10. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8 through 10. The gifts are as follows, and you better write them down. They're wisdom, knowledge, faith, if I'm going too fast, you can simply look at that chart, okay? Healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Now, you can tell that some of these gifts, they're no longer available today if you're a Bible believer, but that's the reason why you need to be familiar with this because charismatics will abuse this passage. So you need to open your ears and pay special attention. The second category is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. That's the second category of the kinds of gifts. The first category we covered is going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. That's what we just looked at. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. All right, let's go through the second category of gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. They are the gifts of apostle, teacher, helper, and administrator. If you didn't catch that, then you can look at the verse and write it down. They are apostles, prophets, teachers, helpers, and administrators. Now, the other things in that <clears throat> verse are already mentioned in the first category of the kinds of gifts. All right, Ephesians chapter 4 is the next one, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. And then 11 through 16. 11 through 16. The three verses are 7, 11 through 16. The next category is the gifts of evangelist and pastor. The gifts of evangelist and pastor. So if some of you are wondering why are there pastors in churches? Why are there evangelists? Why do we have administrators or helpers, etc., etc.? Now you know, these are the verses. We don't do things mostly by our own traditions, we mostly go by the Bible. So we try to be biblically centered as possible. 
This is not to say that some practices in the church, if they're not mentioned in the scripture, that they are unscriptural or that they're wrong. A lot of things that we do is not mentioned in the Bible. But I want us to try to get in the habit of realizing that most of what we say and do is biblically based, and they are based off of scripture. So that's why you should pay attention to this list. Romans chapter 12, verse 6 through 8 is the next category. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Here are the following gifts. Exhorting, which is the same thing as encouraging people. Giving, so that's giving money to the church. So if you didn't know that, now now's the time to know. Ruling, ministering, and showing mercy. Now, these are very good gifts. People say, I don't have a gift that I can use for the Lord. Look through this list. I guarantee you don't even have just one. I guarantee you have a couple. I promise. I promise that you have a couple from this list. So now we have to understand how we can implement it. How do you receive these gifts? So that's the next section, receiving gifts. Let's talk about the receiving of gifts. How you receive the gifts is basically in two forms, two forms by receiving gifts. The first one is done by being baptized of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to receive the gifts, the first one is getting baptized with the Holy Spirit. How you get baptized in the Holy Spirit is not that you implement the gift of tongue first to receive the baptism. That's what charismatic churches are telling you. No, it's the, uh, they got it backwards. It's the other way around. You receive the Holy Ghost baptism first, and then you implement the gift. If you're going to be totally honest, there's a bunch of charismatics who say, well, when you get baptized with the Holy Ghost and you speak in tongues... But if you're going to be really serious about it, you notice that people have to feel something first and then force themselves to speak in tongues that they don't know how to speak it and then claim that, oh, I must have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In other words, they're speaking in tongues first to prove that they have the baptism. So it's backwards. No, you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost first and then... You speak in, uh, you're able to implement the gifts. Speaking in tongues is no longer a gift that's available today, but we'll cover that later on. Now, how do you get baptized with the Holy Spirit is 1 Corinthians 12. Same chapter that talks about gifts, right? So why don't you look in that same chapter? They don't read. Is getting into the body of Christ. That's how you get baptized by the Holy Spirit is you get into the body of Christ. Verse 4, verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Okay, then how do you get the Spirit? Verse 13, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. So it's when you get into the body of Christ. Okay, how do you get into the body of Christ? Simple. You receive the gospel. Go to Ephesians 2. Write down Ephesians 2. Ephesians 3, excuse me. Ephesians 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And then uh, verse 6. Ephesians 3 verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the what? Same body. Okay, body of Christ. Remember 1 Corinthians 12? If you get in the body of Christ, you get the baptism. Okay, how do you get in the body of Christ? And partakers of his promise in Christ by the what? Not by speaking in tongues, by the gospel. Speaking in tongues or any other gifts is after baptism. To get the baptism, it's by the gospel. See that? So charismatics get it backwards. The second one is Ephesians 4. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. 
The second way, or the second thing that you need to add to receive the gifts, is not just Holy Ghost baptism, but you need God the Son to get involved. And that's his ascension, ascension. A lot of people don't realize why Jesus Christ had to ascend up to heaven. You might say, why would he do that? Uh, why can't he be here with us? Otherwise, he can't give you the gifts of the Spirit. See, then we would be dependent on Jesus Christ. We wouldn't be able to independently work for ourselves and use our gifts for the Lord. Now, let's be honest, we're pretty guilty of that. That's a human nature. You notice when somebody has the gifts or more talent than you, you become dependent on that person and you don't work your gift, your skill yourself. So that's a problem and that's the reason why Bible believers are not growing. Now, when you go through trial and suffering, you say, oh God, help me get out of here. Oh God, help me get out of here. That's a human nature, you have a problem depending on Jesus Christ, rather than trusting in the power of the Holy Ghost that you have, that you can go through the trial yourself. Right. Now, did that make any sense? So our human nature, we want to be dependent on something where they do all the work for us rather than we doing the work ourselves. We're supposed to work it out ourselves because we have the Holy Ghost in us. Yeah. That's Philippians 2, right? right? So because the Holy Ghost of salvation is in us, we're supposed to work that out, not be lazy and do nothing about it and have somebody else do the work for us. All right, now uh, we look at Ephesians 4, verse 7. Unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. All right, how do we receive these gifts? Because, verse 8, wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto man. Uh, notice the last part, verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things and he gave some, there's your gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints. So his ascension is very crucial, otherwise you would not receive the gifts. Now go to John 14 and John 16. John 14 and John 16. Jesus said that if I do not ascend up to heaven, then the Holy Ghost won't descend down to you. Why is that important? You get that? Jesus Christ, you notice this here? Baptism. What's that? He's descending on you. But Jesus Christ has to be the one gone. He has to ascend. Why? That way God can be able to work through the other person of the Trinity. He won't be able to do that with this other person in the Trinity in the way. So this person in the Trinity has got to go so that his spirit can work. What are we all operating under? The spiritual power, yeah. not physical body of Jesus Christ. See that? Notice that a lot of churches and religions, they need physical objects, taste, see, touch. Catholic Church, that's why they have these rituals and traditions. Church of Christ, they need a baptismal tub. Take that thing away, you take away their salvation. Us, if you take away our building and everything we got, we still are able to be used by God. And we still got peace. Why? Because everything's done by the Spirit. But how can the Spirit do that if He's not going to descend on us? If you want the Spirit to be there, then Jesus Christ in His physical body got to get out of there. So notice that's necessary if you look at that picture. It makes a lot of sense. Jesus Christ ascends so that the Holy Spirit can descend. He can replace Christ's role. Look at John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father shall send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So Jesus promised to give them the Spirit based on chapter 16, chapter 16, verse 7, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is what? Expedient for you that I go away. 
That means it's a must. So I'm not exaggerating here. Jesus Christ has to get out of the way so that the Holy Spirit can come. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. All right. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Now remember, how are you able to operate the gifts? Because the Spirit baptizes you, right? Now, what does that mean, baptism? That means he's covering you. He's immersing you. So how can the Holy Spirit get in you? See that? That's what baptism is. So how can he get in you where you can operate out the gifts? How can he do that if Jesus Christ does not ascend? Jesus Christ said, if I don't ascend, then the Holy Spirit won't baptize you. Then that, what that means is you can't work out your gifts, guys. See that? So you won't be able to use your gifts for the Lord. That's why that thing is important to understand. All right, now let's uh, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, going through the different things about the gifts. Let's talk about the giving of gifts. Let's talk about the giving of gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and then verse 11. Verse 11. It's important to understand that gifts are different from what other people have. And they are given by the will of God. Why that is crucial is if you want to find God's will in your life, you already know. God said, I've given you a gift. So, are you using your gift? A lot of people wonder, what's the will of God in my life? What's the will of God in my life? Well, what can you do for the Lord? Mm -hmm. Then why don't you start out with that? That's God's will. Right. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. But all these worketh that one in the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he what? Will. will. See, so the gifts that he given differently to everybody, that's his will. He intends for you to use it, not waste it. All right, look at verse 18, 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. You're not going to displease the Lord if you have a skill or talent that you're not using for him. So use it for the Lord, for crying out loud. Stop sitting on your blessed assurance and wait for pastor or wait for a sign from God or some kind of open door to do something for him. You already have something you can do for the Lord. All right, let's look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. You feel like you're getting help enough already? I hope you're getting helped enough already. A lot, I talk to so many people. Uh, one of the number one things in counseling, believe it or not, is people who don't know what God's will is on their lives. Well, what will help you give clarity is, well, what gifts did God give to you that he expect you to use? See? All right, let's look at Ephesians 2, verse 16. Gifts vary because the Spirit puts the right kind of Christian in the right kind of place in the body of Christ. So you'll notice right here with the body of Christ, how it's demonstrated as a lost sinner, we've looked at the previous sections. Once he believes in Jesus Christ, then he gets baptized, correct? It's not speaking in tongues, blah, blah, blah. So notice this guy is not spitting, okay? So he's not spitting and he gets baptized, all right? That's a big no, no, all right? No, all right? He believes. That's the key here. Once he believes on Christ... That's equated the same thing as baptized in the Spirit. Then you get into the body of Christ, but they all differ from each other. They all differ from each other, but they're in the same body. See that? Yep. This guy, notice this arrow here, this guy is not the same as this guy. But they're still the same because they're in that body. That's how it operates. So when we look at 1 Corinthians, uh, Ephesians, excuse me, Chapter 2, verse 16, 16. And that he might reconcile uh, both unto God in one body by the cross, 
having slain the enmity thereby. So the context is body of Christ. Look at 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an inhabitation of God through the Spirit. Notice right here God's intention for you to implement your gifts is to fit everything well. See that fitly framed. It suits you, your personality, where you come from. I understand when you are a new believer, there are things you have to change about yourself. So there's no doubt about that. We all make mistakes through our overzealousness or through our misunderstandings. Nevertheless, you noticed that you still never left you. That there were things about you that you corrected, but you realized you still can use for the glory of God. So don't think that when you have to change some things about yourself that yourself is gone. No, that's not what it is. What you're doing is you're making yourself better. Amen. That's what's going on. We're going to uh, look at 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. So never think that your personality or who you are, that it's wrong, that the Lord will never use it. No, the Lord will use it for his glory. Even when you correct things about yourself, that does not mean that God wants those things to be gone, to be totally eradicated and replaced with something else that's not you. God, he wants you, even when you correct some things about yourself, that those things will still be used for his glory. The key is it fits well for the body of Christ. That's what you're going to notice. Things about you that fits well for the body of Christ. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. So notice each gift is perfect for each person. Never think that God has not given you the right one. And never think that the gift God has given to you is the wrong one. So if there's something that you hate about yourself and you say, I wish this thing would go away, then you better stop yourself and you better, believe it or not, you might have to repent. Because that's who you are and that's how God used you for. So you should never apologize. You should never hate that. Now, remember, again, if there's some incorrect things about yourself that you hate doing, that you keep messing up in, that's understandable, that's fine, and yeah, you should correct those things, but never remember this, again, let me repeat myself, those things about yourself that you're correcting, that doesn't mean you're eradicating yourself. So if you're hating who you are, to the point that you want that thing to be eradicated rather than honed and improved by God, then your heart's not right with him. So you have to always think about, this is who I am, and I want God to use me as I am for his glory. I should never hate that. A lot of time people get depressed and get over guilty or face a lot of shame is because they hate themselves. And when they hate themselves, then they're hating the body of Jesus Christ. Okay? So you're hating what God has given to you. Now, if God gave you a precious gift where he died for it, where he baptized you his spirit for it, where Jesus ascended to heaven for it, I would be very careful to hate the gift that God has given to me. All right, now let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 12 again, 1 Corinthians 12. Let's talk, let's talk about the prophet of gifts, the prophet of gifts. The gifts are supposed to profit the body of Christ. Now, we talked about the individual, right? How you're important. God has given you a unique gift, but it's not to yourself. Now, this is why many people mess up. A lot of people, even advanced Christians, mess this up. 
They mess this up, and this is such a basic doctrine that you and I should know. Why do you hate yourself the way God made you to be? And then why do you go to the other extreme where you're so stuck on yourself that you don't benefit the body of Christ? So these two must operate together. That's how you implement the right gifts. That's how you know the right gifts, is what is it that who I am that is a blessing to people, not a burden? See, that's the problem with people is that when they hear me discuss about the last section about never apologize who you are, that's how God made you to be, then people are just so uh, foolish and they outrightly go, okay, yeah, I should never apologize and I'm going to do whatever God leads my heart to do it. And when they do it, it actually turns out to be a burden to people. Not a blessing. And that does happen, and that did happen before. And people in this church know it and seen it and witnessed it. So you've got to learn on stop be thinking about yourself. What do others think? See that? So the idea is this, is that when you're thinking about others, you're also thinking at the same time about yourself that God has used you for. So you shouldn't hate that. These two should work together, not against each other. Did that make any sense? That's what people are doing. When people always think about others, then they're like thinking about, when they're thinking about others, oh, I can't do this thing for the Lord. You use that against yourself. And then when people are thinking about themselves, oh, I can use this for the glory of God, but then it goes against others. See, no, that's not how it works. These two should work together. So let's look at prophet of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. The Bible says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. See that? If God gave you a gift, it's supposed to benefit the body of Christ. It's not supposed to burden them. Go to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. <clears throat> Notice that your gift is supposed to Profit the whole Christian body of Christ. It is not supposed to burden them. If the Christian body is not more profited, then write, note this, you are not using your gift. So let me repeat that again. If you think that the Holy Spirit led upon your heart to do this thing where it's who you are or your gift that you can use for the Lord, but the Christian body is not being more profited out of it, then you are not using your gift. You're using then a fleshly gift, not the gift the Spirit gave to you. So then your deed then, get this, what you just did is out of the flesh, not by the Holy Spirit. Your flesh think that it was the Holy Spirit leading your heart to do it, but it wasn't. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will never go against the body of Christ. What the Holy Spirit leads on your heart to do something, it should be something that is not against but for that benefits the body of Christ. So when we look at 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, as every man hath received the gift. See this? If you do have it, okay, I got it, then what? It should do this. Even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. It's supposed to minister. Well, I did minister to them, but they didn't feel ministered unto. Well, maybe that's because you didn't minister to them. Minister to them means that they should be ministered, not what you think should minister to them. A minister is a waiter. He's supposed to serve customers. See that? The waiter is not supposed to feel like, well, I did serve them. No, the customer should be satisfied with your service. All right, now let's look at 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Like the human body does not have unnecessary parts. The body of Christ does not have unnecessary parts. So let me ask you this, okay? Is your fingernail a necessary part of your body? If you don't think so, then line up and uh, we'll have somebody pull your fingernail out of your body. Even something like this, you'd realize is important. Now let me be a little crude and please pardon me, but I just want you to get the memo, okay? Even dung inside you is necessary. 
Well, don't I just uh, get it out of me and flush it down the toilet? Well, if every part of you, in every dung inside of you was really out of you, do you know how energetic you would be today? <laughs> You'd feel like throwing up. You need something in there. So what's my point? My point is even something so debase, yeah, okay. so lowly that you think, is necessary for your body. So uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21. Notice, and the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem, look at this, to be more feeble are what? Necessary. All right, if you keep reading down to verse 26, it's really good. But see, no matter how useless you think the person is in the church, get this, listen, okay? No matter how useless you think the person is in the church or how much you think the other person is more able than you, those two thoughts are absolutely wrong. Every single person is absolutely necessary. The Christian body should not have useless people. The Christian body should not have useless people. And if you think that you're useless, then that, that ain't of the spirit. That's your flesh. That's the devil talking to you. So each and every one of you are useful. It doesn't matter if you think somebody is more gifted than you. And it doesn't matter if you think somebody else in this church should not be in this church. Every one of you is necessary in this church. You wonder why Bible-believing churches aren't spreading out. Because of this false mentality that people are not correcting, including advanced Bible-believing Christians. All right? Go back to the basics. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Now, I like this one. The Christian body can become useless by people. So I'll tell you how you can make the body of Christ useless. When people claim to have the gifts, when they actually don't. All right? Remember, there's always a false balance. There are people who think that they don't have the gifts of the Lord, but the Lord intended it. But then there are people who think that they have the gifts of the Lord when they don't. You know what's a good example of that? <laughs> I have the gift of tongues. No, you don't. No, you don't, buddy. All right? And you, what you've done is you made the church useless by doing that. And if you want an example, have the people come to your church while you're spitting and, and then like that, and let's see... Uh, if they think that your church is uh, useless or useful. Proverbs 25, 14. The Bible says, Whoso boasteth himself of a what? False gift. See that? Is like clouds and wind without rain. Well, I have the gift of healing and I can heal you. And uh, no, you're useless then. You're useless. And God would prefer that you stop doing that and then shaming the body of Christ and damaging people's lives who expect God to heal them and then they don't get healed. All right, now let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. But you notice also that's practical living too, right? So that's practical living. Get this, and Dr. Walker said this before, is that not everyone has the gift of preaching. So don't think that you're Mr. Hotshot and get on this pulpit and do something when you can't preach a lick. And I'm sorry, but that's not your gift that God has given to you. So if there's something that God has not gifted you, don't do it. Amen. Well, how do I know, you know? I told you, the body of Christ. That's how you can know. Did it minister them? Did it bless them or did it burden them? Did it make them feel uncomfortable? Is there something wrong there? See that? So that's how you know if you have the gift or you don't have the gift. So don't do it. You'd shame yourself. Not only that, there are people, get this, there are people who really love the Lord. They're serious people. They sacrificed everything for Jesus Christ to go out into the mission field. You know that? 
and they thought that was their gift from God. And then they hurt their family. Some of them got, went through divorces, kids split. Some of them, which is sad, get this, some of them, some of the children ended up where they're mentally broken permanently. That's what happens when you think that the Spirit led you to do something and it's not, and you can cause extreme damage. So that's why be very careful with gifts that you think God has given to you when he didn't. Well, then how do I know? And then I told you, it's so simple. Is it blessing the body of Christ? Uh, when you look through that list of gifts, okay, it talked about showing mercy, right? So then when I showed mercy to somebody in the church and they got a blessing out of that, wouldn't I know then, oh, that's a blessing to someone and I, it would encourage me to keep using my gifts? Think, look at people. What do they get a blessing out of from you? All right? You, and you can only know that when you come to church. That's why I keep emphasizing about people coming to church. Well, you know, I know the Bible. I don't need to go to church. And that's why you're useless to the body of Christ. See that? How you're going to become useful is that you go to church. That way you can know if all oh, the Bible that you know, Mr. Online or you, is a blessing or a burden to them. Okay? Or the things that you can do for the Lord if they're a blessing or a burden. You can only know that when you come to church. That's why we emphasize so much coming to church, fellowshipping with people. When you do that, you can tell what blesses the person or what makes the person uncomfortable. And then you find your gift through there. Did that make any sense? That's very important, okay? Okay. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. Let's talk about the desire of gifts now. The desire of gifts. So, do you desire gifts? You know one thing the problem I do not like with our Bible-believing crowd is that they lack a vision, I realized, more and more. They just want to go be content with their own thing in life, which I do not like. They should have big vision, big dream. Now, again, like I told you, you got to be careful of those who are overzealous and into false gifts, right? They can do more harm than good. But then you don't want to land on the other extreme of being passive and complacent. Now, do you understand why this basic doctrine is so important? Everybody is on the wrong extreme somewhere. Everybody. Do you realize if we all get this doctrine right, basic doctrine, if we all get this right, don't you think our church might grow? Don't you think more people will get blessed? On, now, use your head if... Well, never mind, forget it. Uh, I got to get going. Okay, 1 Corinthians 12.31, okay? 1 Corinthians 12.31. People lack this, but what? Covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. Now, God commanded you to desire the best gifts. If you do, then you will tend to use the gifts stronger than other people. People who have a strong desire for gifts, they tend to use it more faithfully. They tend to use it more passionately. You know how I know that people are not going to be faithful in this church? When they don't have a passion, when they don't have a desire there. If you have a desire, it's easier to serve God. Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. 12. Now, this is very eye-opening, isn't it? You learn so much here. Our church would vastly improve if we get this doctrine right. All right, so if you want the best gifts, do you want it? I don't think people really want it. Do you really want the best oh, gifts? Do you really covet it? Okay, then you'll want to open your ears and pay attention to these parts, okay? Prophesy is considered one of the best gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has set some in the church first. See that? Apostles secondarily what? Prophets. See that right there? So notice right here that this is on a high level of gifts. 
Notice in verse 29, are all apostles. That's first, and obviously there are no apostles today, so that won't work. But look at this, are all prophets. See that? So that second high level is there, so then you can use that one. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. Chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after charity and desire. See that again? Spiritual gifts. So these are the best gifts mentioned. But rather that ye may what? Oh, prophesy is extremely taken highly here as one of the best gifts. Look at verse 39. Verse 39. The Bible says, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. See that? Notice that this is considered to be a higher gift than tongues. So even though they're not forbidden, uh, they're not forbidden to speak with tongues in this passage, prophesying is still more highly coveted and is considered the higher gift priority. So if you look up in Webster's 1828 dictionary about prophesy, it means to speak the word of God. And the word of God is what? Prophesying. It is telling people about the future. So how much are you a good witness, right? How much are you good at testimony to your family? How much are you living by the word of God? Your life should be a prophecy to others. Don't you know that? People take testimony very lightly, don't they? That's the most precious thing. Desire, covet your testimony. The best spiritual gift. If you don't, then I can see what you're desiring. In reality, you're probably desiring fame, glory, possession, the world. All right. Uh, chapter 12, verse 28. So notice right here that tongues are considered the least gifts, while prophesying is far better. Well, the Bible says don't forbid them to speak in tongues. And then it makes you want to ask them, why are you so obsessed with speaking in tongues? It shows me right here you're prioritizing that more than preaching the Word of God. And you wonder why charismatics are so lovey-dovey churches and they don't preach the whole Word of God to you? They don't get into doctrine, right, doctrine? And they're all about the love of Jesus Christ and blah, blah, blah feelings? That shows they prioritize the least spiritual gift. Okay, now, we look at <coughs> chapter 12, verse 28. Notice what's at the bottom, diversities of tongues. See that? Uh, look at verse uh, 30. Bottom, speak with tongues. Now, chapter 14, verse 1. Desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy, right? That's higher. But look at verse 5. I would that ye all speak with tongue, but rather that ye what? Prophesy, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. So here's the thing. If a charismatic thinks that uh, he's better than you or more spiritual than you because you lack the spiritual experience and you only know more Bible than his spiritual experience, you can pull up this verse and say, no, actually being a Bible believer is better than being a charismatic. That's, right. that's not arrogance. That's not trying to stop someone. That's just scripture. So... Uh, what, who, which church would you rather attend, a charismatic church or a Bible-believing church? Who would you rather be, a Bible-believer or a tongue-speaker? I'll tell you what the Bible says. You better be a Bible-believer. All right. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 12, verse 31. 12, verse 31. Now, you know what's better than prophesying? Charity. Yeah. And that's what Bible-believers lack. They know so much Bible, but they lack charity. That's not the same thing as the charismatic, lovey-dovey Jesus Christ. Because the love of Christ or genuine charity will not hide or conflict with the Word of God. See, charismatics, they don't prioritize the Word of God. All right, uh, when we look at 1 Corinthians 12, 31, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you unto you a what? More excellent way. What is that? Verse 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. See that? Verse 2, gift of prophecy and have not charity, I am what? So it doesn't matter how much of that book you know. Okay. Bible-believing people, including pastors, 
They're all nothing. And I wonder if they get nothing at the judgment seat of Christ because of that lack of charity and division and pointing fingers, accusing. I'm just so sick and tired of that. It's making me sick in my stomach. And actually, seriously speaking, I do feel like going to the bathroom right now after saying that. That's how disgusted I am. Verse 3, if you don't have charity, you're nothing. Verse 13, and now abide in faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. How about that? You believe every word in that book to be perfect? And then uh, if there's someone out there who doesn't but has more charity than you, then that person is better than you. Remember, I think Dr. Walker mentioned that he preached something very hard, that you can be a King James Bible believer, but if you don't have as much Christian living or charity or something of that effect, then those people are better than you, Bible believers. Watch out for that. All right, Matthew 25, Matthew 25. Oh, my goodness. Uh, okay, yeah, like I said, there's so many verses, but we don't have time, okay? So what I want you to do is just write these verses down, okay? So we don't have time, so just write them down. Matthew 25, verse 14 through 15, verse 14 through 15, and verse 20 through 23, verse 20 through 23. Okay, I'm going to start drawing on the whiteboard real quick. That way um, people can follow along. I got to get, get on the move here. All right, the more talents or abilities you have, the more rewards you have. So keep finding more talents or abilities from God. You're going to notice that how this one servant was able to gain more cities to rule. See that? More rewards is that he used more of his talents for the Lord. So what you should be doing is not be content with the talent that you have. Like I told you, that's the problem with Bible believers today. All right, content with what they got and they're not striving for more. You got to desire more. You got to find more out there. You know what? One instrument is not enough. Find another instrument to play. Come on. Preaching is not enough. See if you can pastor people better. See, just fellowshipping with people is not enough. See if you can be a prayer warrior for them. Come on. You see what I mean, jelly bean? What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that's the problem with us Bible believers. We're not constantly striving for more gifts that we can use for the Lord, all right? I don't care if you can play the piano and uh, play 1,000 songs. Find another instrument that you can use for the Lord. Or you yourself sing for the Lord. Amen. I don't care if you can preach an a excellent sermon. You're only good in topical sermons. Now work on expository. That's good. Come on. What if I thought that I'm the best preacher in the world? <laughs> you know two years ago I was working on improving myself, right? Yeah. I already had a name and I already had respect from people, but I, that did not stop me. I wanted to be the best. Why? Because I want to feed and minister the body of Christ and give you guys the best, and I intend to do it that way till the day that I die. Amen. Don't you think I would have been content with dispensational teachings? I already have 100 plus videos. Then how would you have heard of spiritual dispensationalism from me if I'd been content? Come on, brother. All right, let's desire. Yeah. Let's desire. No, what you have is not enough. Signing up on the volunteer sheet and bringing food is not enough. Now serve tables. Wash the tables. Mop the floors. Et cetera, et cetera. If you want more rewards in heaven. Well, I'm so worried about the judgment seat of Christ that I'm only going to get one piece of gold because I didn't do so much for Jesus Christ. Oh, let me solve that problem for you, all right? Find other things you can do for the Lord. So maybe despite of how bad your life is, if you find 10 more talents, at least you'll get 10 more pieces of gold. 10 more cities to rule. Maybe those 10 more things will qualify you for five crowns. Okay. Okay. Find something to do. Right. Amen. So, 
more talents equals more reward. The next one is James 1.17. James 1.17. And Luke 11, 8 through 9. Luke 11, 8 through 9. Verse 13. Verse 13. If you really want more gifts from the Holy Ghost, you need to pray to God harder for more. Do you do that? I think people are afraid to do that, aren't they? That's the reason why God's not giving you more gifts. So pray for more gifts. All right, the use of gifts. Now let's talk about the use of gifts. God commands you not to be negligent with your gifts. It's a command, actually. You better be using it. All right, how well are you using your gifts for the Lord? I mean, I'm, I'm asking you a question. Uh, how well are you using your gifts for the Lord? If you're not content, that's a good thing. Good. 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 Desire earnestly the best gifts. So then start doing something more for the Lord. Find more gifts you can use for the Lord, okay? Even if pastor says, no, that won't edify the body of Christ, when you ask him, can I use this gift for the Lord? Can I do this for the church? And I say, no, I don't think that's going to work. Hey, don't, don't get defeatist mode and say, oh, uh, you know, pastor shunned me down and now I can't use my gift for the Lord. No, I'm saving you from using a false gift. Because remember, you're supposed to use gifts that profit the body of Christ. You need to stop being lazy and feeling sorry for yourself and start looking for other gifts out there that you can use for the Lord. That's good. All right? So when pastor shuns you down, find something else to do <laughs> and keep coming to him. All right? Amen. If he strikes you out a hundred times, at least you're going to hit one that he might say, okay, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. And, I, and if you come to me, you know that's not the case anyway. Yeah. All right? So what's holding you back? No gift is to be fallen behind when Jesus comes for us. See, the rapture is the key, is the scary thing you have to think about. God, when he comes down, he's going to expect you to bring your gifts to him and say, what did you do for me? That's why you can't be negligent. The Ruckman Reference Bible says this passage is to be memorized. So this passage is to be memorized. That's what Dr. Ruckman recommended, believe it or not. Now, let's say that you don't want to use your gift. Okay, then fine. God will take away your gift. Oh, he, he wouldn't do that. He, he, he don't. Come on. Especially if you used your gifts to sin. I mean, if you use your gifts to sin, I mean, I know of Christians, for example, uh, who get into worldly music or popular music, rock music, stuff like that, rap music. And then they use their singing for the, uh, for the Lord. And it is actually switched into that uh, rock music popular genre instead. <laughs> Trust me, the Lord will teach you a lesson real soon on that one. There are other people who say, well, I have the gift of teaching the word of God when it's a false gift and that becomes a burden to people. God can take away that gift. Uh, people use gifts in their own fleshly senses. See that? When they do that, then God will take that away from you if you're not careful. Be careful what you say and what you see. Those gifts that you have for the Lord, he just might blind your eyes and uh, just uh, take away your taste. Uh, that's in Luke chapter 19, verse 20, 24, and 26. Now, if you compare that with the book of Matthew that we saw earlier, he calls it pound, but don't let that deceive you. That's also another word for talent in Matthew, okay? So it's the same thing. God can take away your gift and give it to another person. And then you'll see that person preaching on the pulpit where you neglected the gift to preach on the pulpit. Hey, do you know how many... Uh, man, this is like so much preaching mode here. Come on, do you understand how many elderly people who are in their beds, they try to tell you younger people what you should do, what you should do, and what they've regretted doing that you should fill in for them? 
You know why they do that? Because they failed to use their gift and now somebody's living it out for them. Your time will come, trust me. Well, you know, I have plenty of time to serve God. No, you don't. No, you don't, especially when you go through a health problem. Some people can't sing here anymore, you know that? Some people can't preach. Some people can't come to church every Sunday. If you don't think so, you have not been looking around this church. Do you know how many people would love to have the health that you got, the gift that you have, so they can do it for the Lord? When God gives you something, he expects much out of it. Okay, I, am, I really need to go through it here. So uh, just write them down, ready to speed, right? Luke chapter 12, verse 48. Okay, when God gives you something, he expects much out of it, not little. So let's assume you even only have one gift. Well, I only have one gift I can use for the Lord. I highly doubt that, okay? I know you have several, and you can look at that list at Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, like I told you, okay? I think the problem is you despise those gifts God give, give to you, and you want to find something else out there in your fantasy land, okay? But anyway, um, even if you only have one, then wear that gift out till the day you die. Amen. If your only gift is legs to walk, to drive, to come to church, wear that thing out till the day you die. Yeah. 2 Timothy 1.6, that's the next one. 2 Timothy 1.6. Not only are you to use the gift profusely, but you need to get this, improve it successfully. You need to improve it. That goes back to the beginning, that there are things about yourself that you shouldn't apologize who you are. That God has given to you. It's just your personality. You're different. And God wants to use you for his glory. But you notice that the thing that you have for the Lord is not really being used by God. Well, when you're correcting it, you're not getting rid of it. What you're doing is you're improving it. You're honing it. So remember, we have to know this balance here. Everyone is this extreme or that extreme. Okay? The other one is... Romans 1, 11 through 12. Romans 1, 11 through 12. So here's the thing. If pastor corrects you, you know what I would do if I were you? I would not get offended by that. I would not ignore that. I would not say, oh, I don't know about that. I do whatever I can to apply it into my life and practice it out so I can home my gift faster. Now, there's one thing I, you know about me, okay? There's one thing you know about me. I mentioned about waiting on the Lord and patience, but you're talking to a guy who wants to hone your skill as fast as possible. Yeah. And if you don't believe that, then you probably weren't paying attention under my discipleship. Okay. But I took three years, 10, 20 years to have what I have now, and I give stuff in beginner's discipleship that, is not, that I didn't know until like 15 years later. Now, if there's one thing you know about me, I get you growing really fast. That's why I, the first thing I do when I disciple you is soul winning. You know why? I know that's going to get you to establish the other gifts very fast. Amen. I know what will get you growing fast. So if you can't take patience with my method, then you're pretty much hopeless. Come on. If you can't take lessons or corrections or guidance from what I'm trying to give to you, then good luck out there. Now, I'm not saying I'm the best, all right? I'm not trying to be cocky. But the reason why I'm being very serious here is that we live in a day and age of people who refuse to be taught, corrected, or guided. I'm giving my resume here to try to convince you. That's what I'm doing, okay? But if you don't think so, that's fine. Go to every other church out there, and then you're going to find out that no one is perfect like you and no one understands you. That's what you're going to come down to and stay in your selfish little bubble stuck online. Okay. Wow. All right. Now, there are better teachers out there, okay? And there are more talented people out there who train and disciple people better than, than others out there, okay? So I want to give that disclaimer. But I'm trying to convince you that, hey, I'm giving you one of the best here to grow really fast and much. Yeah. 
So can you try to accept that so you can finally grow? I'll tell you how you're going to waste time is you don't get trained. You don't receive correction. You're afraid. You're afraid of it because of how you appear or look. Okay? All right, Romans chapter 1, verse 11 through 12. Romans chapter 1, verse 11 through 12. The purpose of the gifts is to strengthen your faith in God. The purpose of the gifts is to strengthen your faith in God. So if you've been lacking faith lately, then you just have to see if you've been using your gifts well. I know why you've been living in doubt. You're not implementing your gifts. You're stuck at home, doing nothing, not getting involved in church or with people. You're helping us, brother. Come on. A lot of good stuff here, preaching, right? This is very practical because gifts is you working it out. That's the reason why there's so much practical information here. All right. Unavailable gifts. So there's a lot of verses on unavailable gifts, but uh, I'm going to give you only a couple things. What I would recommend for people out there who are watching, if you want the full notes on that one, my recommendation is to watch my video, How to Witness to Charismatics how to witness to charismatics. But that will prove that these certain gifts are un unavailable. Now, out of the 20 gifts that you saw, there are four gifts that are unavailable. The four gifts, they are as follows from that list. They are healers, miracle workers, not miracles itself, okay? Miracles are still ongoing, going, but miracle workers are gone. Tongues and apostles, okay? So out of the four, these are unavailable. Why are they unavailable? Because what you're going to notice that tongues, healings, and miracle workings are called signs. Okay? So write that down. They're called signs. Now, signs followed the apostles, believing apostles. Not just to all those that believe on Christ. No, the context is believing apostles who were going through doubt. That's Mark chapter 16, verse 14 through 18. 14 through 18. The other one is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Now, obviously, since the apostles died out, then the signs that followed the apostles, what happened? Yeah. Died out. Yeah, because they only followed the apostles. No, they followed everyone who believed on Christ. No, that's not true. The evidence is... Say believers were turning to the apostles right. to heal someone. Amen. So that's found in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Here's another evidence. Another evidence is not every saved believer has the sign gifts according to 1 Corinthians 12. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 12 says God divides every man severally as he will. Meaning he doesn't give those uh, sign gifts to everybody. Now, why are they evidently gone? Evidently, they are gone based on, ooh, I have one, two, three, four, five. Five reasons, okay? So here are five convincing reasons why they're gone. So one you have to keep in mind, just because someone does signs in Christ's name doesn't mean that they're not from the devil. The devil can use signs in the name of Christ. That's Mark chapter 13, verse 21 through 23. Mark 13, verse 21 through 23. Here's another one. True signs can no longer be used by the apostles. It's because you're going to find verses where the true signs, they were no longer being used by the apostles. Near the end of their ministry, you can tell. There are three verses to prove it. 1 Timothy 5.23, 1 Timothy 5.23, Philippians 2, 25 through 27. Philippians 2, 25 through 27. And 2 Timothy 4, 20. 2 Timothy 4, 20. Now, if you say that you're an apostle, then you're supposed to use the sign. We're supposed to test you. And if you say, oh, no, I can't do that. Uh, you're tempting the Lord. No, we're testing you. We're supposed to. The Bible commands us to test you you if you have the signs and if you can't do it then you're a liar Amen. revelation chapter 2 verse 2 right. revelation chapter 2 verse 2 
Come on, give a genuine sign that's truly from God, not an easy one. Raise a dead person back to life. Okay. Can't do that, then you're not. Now, here's another reason. The fourth reason is evidence of more than 1,000 years. Now, do you see that chart? That is very convincing. That should be convincing to you, okay? Evidence of more than 1,000 years of no true sign yeah. should Come prove on. that God has been done with signs long ago. With that long silence, suddenly here comes people on TV, charismatics, claiming the signs are available, and they have been caught for fraud even. After all that, can you honestly believe their claim that signs are available today? Come on, brother. Here's the last one. There is no verse clearly proving that sign gifts are available today. Stop concentrating on Acts or in the first centuries. I'm talking about even up to now, 2,000 years later. You won't find a single verse. As a matter of fact, when you get closer to our time period, you'll find more verses showing that they're fading or they're gone or they're ceasing. Okay, so I hope that you've learned a lot. Amen, Doctrinal and practical, you notice that? Yeah. Very helpful. Amen. I hope that uh, you'll now use your gifts for the Lord. Every one of you has a gift. Now use it and use it rightly and let God do something great with your life. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers. Dismiss us now with your blessing. And then help us to live out and implement these gifts, not just say amen, not just write down notes, not just hide the word in our heart. No, it's useless if we don't even use it outwardly. So I pray that you help us to use it outwardly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.